My name is Brian McIntosh, I'm from the Grand River Conservation Authority, and I'm going to talk to you about making information discoverable and accessible at the GRCA. And who is the GRCA? We are, as you heard, we're a regional conservation authority. We do watershed, water management, natural resources for 39 municipalities, about a million residents, covering 7,000 uh, square kilometers. So it's a little bit bigger than the state of Delaware. I looked it up. To do those types of things, we need monitoring data. We've been uh, capturing monitoring data since 1913 on little postcards, and we've actually entered it into our system. Um, the accuracy of where we took those points was probably not the most accurate, but we do have data going back 100 years. And this is, we now store monitoring data in a real database using Kister's technology uh, and store temperature, uh, flow information, stage height, things like that, wind speeds. And once the public heard that we have this information, people started asking for it, especially in the late 90s. We started getting these phone calls saying, we heard you have some data. We'd have farmers calling and saying, how much has it rained in the last few days over my farm? And then a municipality calling up and saying, well, we'd like you to give us a report on the last seven days. And these phone calls kept coming in and coming in to the point where our engineers were fielding so many phone calls, they weren't getting to all their other work. So the work started piling up for these seven-day requests. So then we came up with a little idea of why not make this information available on our website. So in 2001, we started making our seven-day summary information available on our website. This was throughout the entire watershed. We have the whole watershed list behind that graph there of different sections, and you could look at your section of the watershed and actually see what the seven-day uh, precipitation accumulation was, and you could look at river flow information in your area. And when we did that in 2001, we noticed something. We noticed that call volume went down 98%. We'd want to say 100, but there was probably still the odd phone call where we'd say, oh, you should check our website. So the numbers kept going down freeing up a lot of our staff time. At the same time, we noticed that web traffic started to skyrocket, which is never a bad thing, uh, especially when we're dealing with 39 municipalities in our watershed. The awareness that this information was available and the transparency to our regional or our municipalities became key in how we could work with them and how we could communicate with them. Uh, this is also important for things like emergency management. There's a first stop shop, you can go there, and if you have questions, then you can call an engineer if you're from a municipality. So it does cut down on phone calls, and it increases the awareness. And this has been working great. Uh, there's not been a problem with it for years, but times are changing. When we lift up sort of under the hood of our website, we noticed actually that it's pretty complicated with that, what's going on. We're actually doing a bunch of processing. We, uh, we built our own in-house monitoring system in 1984, and we've been using that uh, for a very long time, but it's not meeting all of our needs and it was uh, not ready for the changes in demand that we had on our system. At the same time, our monitoring requirements were changing. We expanded our network. We're now at 100 monitoring stations, multiple parameters at, at those stations. The frequency of the data has also increased from the one hours and the logs going to the real time, the five minute, the 10 minute, the 15 minute data being streamed right into the system. We also have time sensitive things that we need to get out to our municipalities. We can't wait in QAQC data for three days when in two days there could be a flood from that data or we want to anticipate it. We also have more urban areas with more urban flooding. You don't have as long to respond. So you need that data in, you need to be able to ingest it and understand it as quickly as possible. We also have this concept of location aware. I have a GIS background and you know, location, location, location. What's upstream of here? What's downstream? What are the cumulative impacts as we move downstream? These are the new requirements that were coming up as we were getting more and more data. Knowing that our system, designed in 1984, wasn't really made to make all of that, those changes, we made a change ourselves and went with the whiskey product. So you can imagine when I started at the GRCA a few years ago and they said, all right, we're gonna go work on whiskey soda. I was all up for helping out on that one. Because <laughs> they have two products, whiskey and soda. And there's another one called Ice Cube. <laughs> <laughs> I want to be on your naming teams for this for software. 
So in 2012, we made the transition from our own proprietary 1984 system into the Whiskey system, which Michael actually talked about with the multiple time series. We can actually have a view of a time series that is QAQC'd and corrected on the fly. We can spline in or uh, piece in uh, real monitoring updates and it will change all of our curves. So all of that was in the system. And on the engineering side, they implemented Whiskey. And at the same time that all those changes were happening, there was changes from the public. New user types are popping up every day, calling us for data. We have the open data community now that starts asking for data. We have our municipalities who start having all their systems and would love an Excel spreadsheet of uh, the last year of data over their municipality. We also have the developer community and businesses. We have some of our uh, canoe outfitters who are calling asking us for information and wouldn't it be nice if there was an app that could tell them when we're hitting our low flows or really high flows so that it could keep people off the water. And then we have people like the media who when we do have these storm events like we had actually last week, June 28th, um, they want to know right away what's going on. They want to be able to report this information and get the information out there. And then the municipalities are calling and saying, how long do we have? Do we have seven hours or do we have four hours? What can we do? So these new users are coming online in the last few years as technology sort of becomes in everyone's hand. And with those new users comes new questions. The questions now are different than the, we just want a seven day summary of the last seven days. They want wind information in Excel. They want stage information. We want text-based information or put it into Microsoft Access, monthly roll-ups, annual roll-ups, real-time data feeds. These are what the new questions are coming from our partner municipalities and from the public in our watershed. So new users, new questions. And really what we came down to is requests can be as unique as the people making them. That quote's by me and I just said it, so it's true. <laughs> I searched Google and I could not find that quote right off the front first page, so it's mine. <laughs> You can use it in your presentations, just put my name in there. <laughs> now there's still a place for the seven day summary information. We still make that available and we still wanna make that available because there's a bunch of people out there who rely on that information. But we can't forget where all these new questions are coming from as well and we wanna start opening up the information so it's uh, more available. Because what's been happening is all these new users and new questions have started the phone ringing more to the point where we've gone full circle and we're busy again. And the engineers are trying to work on the storm event and the phone starts ringing again and you have the media calling asking for special reports or what's the change over the annual, is this something new or is this sort of on average? So with all that we had to figure out, well what are we gonna do about all this? How are we gonna deal with this situation? There's this thing called web services a way that we can ask multiple types of questions and allow users to ask those questions and then we can uh, allow the system to pull back those answers for our users. So this is the direction we're gonna take now. We're not just gonna answer that one seven day question, we're gonna allow people to ask their questions to the system. There's two main ways that we do that at the GRCA. For GIS data, we actually use ArcGIS server and we expose a lot of our data as web services. So you can consume them in your own arc map or in your own uh, web mashup if you'd like. And now we're actually using Kister's KeyWiz for web services based on all of our time series and monitoring data at the same time. And it's the exact same concept. When I walk by the room and someone says, oh, we're gonna do these web services things with uh, KeyWiz, I stopped and said, well, we do web services. What is it you'd like to do? And they said, well, we have these web services, but we've got to figure out how to use them. And the parallels to how it works with ArcGIS Server are so much so that I actually did the demo that you're going to see. So, and I'm not even a developer. But how our old processes worked, if you look along the top here, is we used to have our internal system and we had to export that data into a separate little can and access and then run some extra processes on that, maybe get it into Excel, do a little extraction, transforming and loading. Finally got it to this area on our website where we can make the seven day summaries available. The difference in using a web service is that people can ask multiple types of questions that we just talked about. To our Esri and Kister's web services, it will go and ask for the information and return it back to the users. 
So we don't have to just set these cookie cutter responses. We can allow people to dynamically ask the questions that they want to ask without the phone ringing. And just in case, we can also do a little question to our web services and still make that seven day service available because we don't want to forget about that. That is still useful. So now I'm going to give you a quick demonstration. First about services, I'm not sure what people's history is on services, charts, and then maps. I scoured the internet and these are all uh, open commons photos, by the way. <laughs> Although I didn't know this was going to be recorded. <laughs> so the first thing, this is, don't bother looking at this website, it's just here to explain that I want to query KeyWiz or I actually just want time series information or station information. And the way I'm going to do that is I'm actually just going to put in an URL. Instead of it actually just being a full website, I can use my browser to ask the question to KeyWiz. And this is the URL that actually asks a question. It actually says, I want a list of stations. Give it to me in an HTML format and just give me the stations that start with the letter B. So let's see what that actually looks like. That actually went to our server at our office, queried the Bs and brought them back and showed them to you in HTML. If you'd like, we can actually just go and change that and just show all of our stations that start with the letter D. It went to our server, asked, and brought back the response. That was pretty quick. And this is actually live running from our office, and I'm just calling it directly from the browser. So there's no sort of um, application on the front end here other than the services listening behind the scenes. Another question you might want to know is, I want all of the daily mean water flow information for a specific station. And this is going to give us all the 2012 data. So we just changed our request, which went to the server and brought back the results for all of 2012. And you can see it ends on the 31st. Since this is a dynamic question to the web service, we could also say, Let's not even say when this is going to go to, which means to now. It's going to reload the web page and bring back all the results all the way to today. So that's real-time interaction with our system using a browser to, to, to ask our own questions. One of the things we also talked about was, well, HTML, yeah, this is great, but what about something like WaterML2? Well, I have other formats available to me through KeyWiz. I can go WML2, hit enter. Now it's going to send the request and it said, but you know what, give me back that response as WaterML. So here's the WaterML link to all of the data. You could then consume it in some of the apps that we saw earlier today just by copying and pasting the SURL into the application. But for David, Let's do CSV. There we go. Downloaded the CSV file. You can open it in Excel. There we go. <laughs> so it's still there. So yes, you can use it as a web service, but yes, David could also grab it into Excel and download it. Beyond that, I'm actually going to do the exact same type of request, but instead of showing it to an HTML, I'm going to trap it in the browser and use a bit of development from a non-developer. And I'm actually going to send three queries. A precipitation, I'm going to ask for precipitation data, flow data, and temperature data. And when I was talking to uh, Michael and Philip Kisters, I said, I heard about these widgets you have. Are they ready? Can I use it? And they said, no, not yet. We're not ready. So I went online and I was like, well, we're dealing with time series. It's a time and a value. Just so I looked online and there's a free thing called high charts, which is actually for stock quotes, time and a value. So I just pulled back the information and I gave it to this chart widget that's freely available on the internet. And it will give me all the times and all the values and chart it all together on the map. We can change the date ranges. We can show all the data, maybe just a week. We can scroll through. You'll see that we actually have a gap in our data that the engineers remove some data. We can actually turn off temperature if it's not important to us and actually just look at the response of rain and how the flow actually responds after the fact. 
we can go near the end and you'll actually see we have rain and then we have increased flow. Uh, no, June 28th wasn't in that one, but we can actually add it to this one here. So taking that chart example and taking it to the next level where we also have these GIS services available to us. So I'm just made this simple web app This probably took a couple days of effort and six web services. One of them is an address search. That's just a web service. It goes to Esri's server, says what's the address, and it comes back with an XY, puts it on a map. On top of that, I could actually just say, well, show me all the rain gauges that have values in the state range. And it's going to go come back with the objects in WaterML2, or in this case, I just bring it back as uh, JSON objects. And I can show you the stations on the map. And then I can start clicking on the map and investigate. This is precipitation data. And I have it set here to do a multi-chart, which means I can start clicking on multiple stations and actually see what's going on in mul multiple stations. And you can see we can just scroll over, we can turn off a couple and just look at one, change our time series. Different type of query, maybe we want to look at stream flow over the same time frame. These examples were put together for our engineers to show them how we can help them look at information in different ways. So they're reviewing this now to see what it is that they like so we can make sort of an internal operational dashboard for them. But here's the uh, flow information. And we can look in our watershed and actually see the flow. Maybe we actually want to look a little further downstream and we can actually see it's just a little behind. And then maybe we want to look down here and you're going to notice it's more jagged, more stepped. That's because we actually have a dam right above that. And you're actually looking at operationalized augmented flow. So as the flow is going up, we're actually operating at the dam to actually show you the different flow levels that are happening right above it. And this is great, but what if you actually want the raw information? So we actually make the raw information available. You can actually just download a PDF of this chart. You can. Uh, View the HTML, and what I did was I actually trapped that request just so you could see what's really going to happen. I'm going to click to get all of the chart information, and this looks familiar. All I've actually done is typed in an URL. So this data is exactly the same data that you saw in the chart. It's actually just visualized differently. And then we also have, you can just Click here to download the CSV, and then you have all of the time series data for all of those parameters available to you as well. On the GIS side, just to show that we also have our GIS layers available to us, you can see we made a web service available that shows you where our watershed is in Ontario, Canada. We also are pulling in information from Environment Canada. We're showing real-time weather. Here's the radar. Or we can actually show it from um, the California Natural Resources Agency republishes a service of NOAA data. So here's the one-hour precip accumulation. We also download seven-day accumulations from NOAA and make it available on our website as another service. We make that service available for all of Southern Ontario, for all other uh, conservation authorities and municipalities as well, so they can consume it and you can actually see the, let's say, let's do a 24 hour accumulation, so a one day. Um, you'll actually notice in the middle, if I go up high enough, we had 100 millimeters in an hour coming through the middle of our watershed and uh, water was waist high on June 28th. So. That actually just happened the other day. So that's just showing pulling in multiple services, some from ArcGIS server and some from KeyWiz, and just showing them together in a collection on a map. I think we hit all of those guys. His name's Domo, by the way, if you want to search for him online. So I hope you can see some ways and opportunities with web services and how you don't have to download data all the time. You can access information directly where it's sitting. 
before we had Kiwis fully running at our office, I wanted to start putting this app together. So I actually just went to the Texas hub and looked for their endpoints of web services. And I just changed a few variables. And now I'm using someone else's data and mashing it up. Uh, Whisk or Kisters also publishes an example at their own office. And I can switch over and just change the couple more variables. And now I'm consuming in their data as well. So there's a real integration going on here between uh, Esri and Kisters and their platforms and how they both make web services available, uh, both in standard formats. Um, our goal moving forward is we're only going to build what we need internally. And we're going to let the world create the rest. That's why we want to expose our web services to the public. We just want to make a few apps that we need and we want the world to research and discover and make the rest of those apps. Because there's people out there who will spend lots of time, they're data geeks, they're in the open data community, and they want to find new ways to use this data. And if you're worried about making your data open, just think about the apps on your phone right now. You probably have a transit app for your local municipality to tell you when the next bus is coming. That's because they've exposed web services to the public. And you can have 50 of those apps out there, and one's going to be the big one. We want to put our web services out there and let the community make those apps, and one of those is going to probably be that big, huge one. We can't guess and develop them all. There's a lot of smart people out there, and, and we want to make the information available to them. So ideas moving forward. Our main concept is to make an operational dashboard for our executives, have an engineering operational view that will just manage by exception. That means you don't show anything on the map unless there's a problem. You show those things on the map when we reach beyond thresholds and you want to start alerting people. Then we can start firing off RSS feeds or uh, alerting the media. And then we're going to go to the open data community and say, hey, we have some information available that you may be interested in. Let's see what you can do. This is what I came up with beyond those two first apps that I made. I drew this on the airplane on the way over here. And this is maybe a download interface to uh, KeyWiz, where you select the monitoring parameters you're interested. Based on that, you choose the stations you're interested in, you choose your date range, and then you choose a format, and it'll give you an URL. And that URL can either uh, direct you to a watermelon L2 file or a link to the CSV data itself, or maybe it's just uh, if you want to be a coder, you can just look at that JSON endpoint and you can start developing. That really was on the plane. So on that note, I'm hoping that you can all see the benefit in web services as well and publish them and make them available for others. I know if others publish their information, that'll also benefit our watershed and our surrounding watersheds. And on that note, thank you very much. <laughs>